All right, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to talk here in this fantastic uh, BPPB seminar series. Uh, so my name is Vivek Prakash. Um, should I go ahead and notice? You can go, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm gonna start with the big picture. Uh, when we look at the entire earth, right? We know that more than 70% of the earth is covered with water. And we know that life began in the oceans. Um, here is a beautiful uh, mandala of plankton. So this gives me goosebumps every time I see it. This is amazing, right? So this is these are all the planktonic animals that uh, were collected by the uh, Tara Oceans Expedition. And um, these diverse enigmatic exotic organisms hold many, many secrets um, waiting to be unraveled. Now these, there are many organisms, so you can classify them in many different ways. So one way is to classify them according to the length scale. So when you go from the smallest scale to the larger scales, uh, you start with the nucleic acids, uh, you go to single celled organisms uh, at micro scales, but when you go to these millimeter scales, you start uh, coming out of these multicellular animals and embryos. And when you go to meter scale, you come to our site, right? So my interest is actually in this range of about 100 microns to about 100 millimeters. So um, I work on very large scales compared to the previous talk. Another way of um, classifying animals is to look at the early branches in the animal tree of life. So here our unicellular relatives gave rise to the first uh, animals and these are the earliest divergent animal systems. Here, as you go towards the top, you're increasing in uh, complexity. Um, so this will go all the way to um, uh, placozoans, cnidarians, or jellyfish, bilaterians include us. So my interest is really in these um, simple marine non-model animal systems. And particularly, I during my postdoc, I'm going to talk about this. I focused on placozoans, and in my future, I'm going to focus on thenophores. So now, the important question, why should we study these simple marine non model animals, right? So there are several, several reasons to do this. Um, there are new questions to ask, uh, new opportunities. These are very, very understudied. So as I said, many secrets waiting to be unraveled. You have the ability to bridge scales. So in these simple animals, you can go all the way from cells to tissues to entire organisms. Uh, so they're very simple. Um, you can get, you can kind of ask questions on the origins of multicellularity, origins of complexity. So it's very exciting. And now this is a great time to be doing this because there are new approaches, new tools. Uh, if you look at um, the biological literature, so uh, we've had so much advances in uh, molecular biology and genetics that these genomes of these animals have been sequenced. Um, and we can carry out in total imaging. That means imaging all the cells in the entire organisms. And of course, there's a fantastic interest uh, from the physics and soft matter communities to study emergent mechanics in these type of animals. So overall, I work in this organismal scale uh, biophysics area. And of course, the broad question here is how does physics shape biology, which is super broad. So I'll focus a bit. Uh, so my interest is really in understanding flows in living animals. And the reason for this is because um, I actually did my um, PhD in fluid mechanics. And this is like my one slide of my PhD. So I did this in, uh, did my PhD in Netherlands and I worked on a three-story water tunnel where I worked with bubbles uh, in water. And um, so there was no biology in this. So this is very much a fluid mechanics PhD. And this is the beauty of switching fields. So I wanted to tell this story for the students here. So just when I was finishing up my PhD, I was looking at, oh, what, which other exciting area will I go to? And the answer is, biophysics, right? That's the most exciting thing. So I came across this video of a jellyfish swimming at an APS conference. This is from John Dabiri's lab. And I was really so excited. Uh, so I got interested in fluid flows around animals. And also there's this other area of uh, tissue mechanics, which is looking at cells, uh, how cells flow in tissues. So I decided to do this for my postdoc, shift fields, great. and. I came from a zero biology experience where in, only in my postdoc, I started how to, I learned how to pipe it, right? So I, I started there. So it's an adventure, but it's really awesome. And I hope to convince you of that. So these are my two primary interests, um, flows of cells and tissues, um, 
fluid flows around animals. So the kind of questions I'm interested in are uh, form function relationships. So how does the form of an animal, its geometry or morphology, give rise to its functional be behavior? Then that could be feeding, motility, reproduction, or development. And another big theme which keeps coming up is the idea of emergent mechanics. How do phenomena at the smallest scale give rise to behavior at the large scales? So um, I'm interested in two different areas, tissue mechanics and fluid mechanics. Um, and during my postdoc, I worked on two different projects. So today I'm gonna to focus on one project on the placas ones. So this work, uh, this was postdoc work done in uh, Manu Prakash's lab at Stanford. Um, most of you are wondering, oh, there are too many Prakash's in this slide, right? So uh, just to clarify to you, we are not related. It's just a common Indian surname. Um, and this project was in his lab and at Stanford and uh, also a huge collaboration with uh, Matthew Bull, a fantastic grad student. So here I'm going to get started with the ductile, ductile to brittle transitions in a simple animal system. So as you know, animals are characterized by their movement. Uh, tissues in animals are always under constant dynamic loading as animals crawl, walk, run, and swim. So the question is, what are the limits of these tissue mechanics in time-varying force landscapes? And we also know that tissues change shape during animal development, right? So during development, the large scale uh, cell uh, movements uh, in, and tissue morphogenetic movements, but when animals reach an adult form, they get a fixed shape typically. typically. The question is though, are there examples where uh, adult tissues change shape? And the answer is yes. If you go down to the lower animals, you usually are very, very fascinating. So in jellyfish, people have shown that if you chop off one of its arms, it can actually regain symmetry in about 50 hours. So that's a fascinating tissue repair process. And in Hydra, people have shown, uh, this is all recent work, that if you, uh, every time the animal feeds, it's actually fracturing, it's rupturing its mouth every time it feeds. And um, of course, there, is, uh, there are lung uh, epithelial stretch induced uh, injuries, which are associated with diseases. So these are the subject, uh, subjects of intense um, cell culture studies right now. So plenty of uh, examples of animal tissues in dynamic force landscapes. So we wanted to understand what are the extreme limits of tissue mechanics in the living animal system. And for this, we chose a simple animal system, a simple animal with a flat epithelial architecture, the tricoplex adherence. So this provides us two key advantages. Uh, first is that it allows us to carry out cellular scale in total live imaging. Uh, so what the video you're seeing is from my colleague's work, Ashahaf Armon, who was also postdoc in Manu's lab. Um, you're seeing the entire animal and this is the top view and um, you're seeing cells contracting. So her discovery was uh, that these cells uh, have one second contraction time scale. So among the fastest, uh, actually the fastest and contractions in the animal kingdom. So this is great. Um, so cellular scale intro to live imaging. And then uh, you can see that there are already these time varying force landscapes due to its motility. So this is a rather small animal. When you look at a large animal, you can see that it has extraordinary shape change, right? So this animal is exploring its environment, stretching, all kinds of arms, all kinds of weird shapes appearing. If you use your imagination, you can start seeing familiar shapes. For example, you see a Snoopy. Yeah, right. So um, these adult animals don't have a fixed shape. So these are all snapshots from our lab cultures. Uh, you can see shapes all the way going from a circle to this really, really long elongated thread-like forms. And there's also a size distribution in these animals. So that's very astonishing, right? Uh, so the question is how do epithelial sheets undergo such extreme shape changes? And uh, another thing, another fascinating phenomena is reproduction. So this animal in the center will basically form two regions which start pulling away from each other and it forms a small thread and the third breaks, right? Uh, so this process is extremely fast. So this was a one hour process and look at the length scale. So it's a three millimeter sized animal. So millions of cells coordinating to accomplish this task in one hour. 
And that's pretty much faster than most biological processes you can think of. So we hypothesized at the beginning that mechanics is playing a huge, huge role in this. So that's our, that was a starting point. Uh, and our hypothesis was that you will find local cell rearrangement, which are rapid uh, in the animals. That's what we're looking for. How do cells rearrange themselves to enable such fast uh, shape change? Here is the body plan of the trichoplex. Uh, these are extremely flat animals like pancakes. So uh, it's 25 microns in thickness, but it can be many millimeters in size. And here is a cut section. Um, it's a three layer structure, three layer epithelium. Uh, there's a dorsal epithelium, a ventral epithelium, and a layer of fiber cells in between. You can see the cell architectures are very, very different. Uh, and importantly, there are the cilia at the bottom. So the cilia are special, they're adherent cilia. So these animals actually crawl on substrates and the cilia can generate traction forces. Okay, so very, very simple animals, beautiful. So these, are, these animals are special because they don't have neurons, no muscles, no ECM, no basement membrane, no tight junctions. Thankfully, they have other end junctions holding cells together. So in one sense, these are simple minimal epithelial tissues. So from both the physics and a biology standpoint, you can start asking uh, questions on what is such a simple system actually capable of accomplishing from a mechanics point of view. So one challenge we immediately had was I wanted to look at all cells in the entire animal. So how do you map large scale morphogenetic flow fields? If you look at the model animals, yes, we have transgenics, light sheet microscopy, so you can image all the cells, but this is a non-model animal, right? Hardly people, nobody studies it. So then the challenge is how do you do large field of view mapping uh, of all cells, spatial temporally? So, and these animals are extremely live and motile. So we had to develop a new technique and this is what we came up with. So the idea is to stack the surface with sticky beads. So I prepared these sticky beads and basically sprinkled them on the animals like shampoo. So once they stick, they're permanently bound. Um, and these beads have a weed gem agglutinin lectin, that's like super glue, it sticks on the membrane. So once you do this, you can totally map out the morphogenetic flow field. It's fantastic. So this is actually a generic technique. We've used this in chick embryo successfully also. So that's a methods paper that I'm currently working on. So once you do this, this is what the raw data looks like. You can do large field of view, high speed, long duration tracking. And once you do this, uh, you can start visualizing trajectories inside. Um, so this is again, remember top view and the animals are crawling. So you're watching them. Um, and this is this technique called flow trace that we developed uh, in Manu's lab. So that's showing you particle trajectories. We can do, for, we can now use further techniques like particle image velocimetry. So these arrows are showing you velocity vectors. So this is now um, trying to map out the morphogenetic flow field as such. So once you have the velocity vectors, um, you can now compute the internal strain. So you're seeing all the colors are fluctuating, right? So um, that means uh, basically the animal is kind of stretching itself all the time and imposing strains inside it. So it's like uh, doing yoga. So we call it self-inflicted rheology. So that's fantastic, right? So this animal is imposing strains inside itself. The question is, so what? Uh, so we were watching many of these movies for long periods of time, and we made this following discovery. So this animal, after one hour, showed that it can actually uh, sustain tissue fractures in its epithelium. So here I'm highlighting this region here. So this is the shear force opening up actual fracture in its epithelium. So I'm highlighting the fracture here. So think about it for a second because uh, fractures are a bad thing, it's a disaster. And if you have a tissue in an animal, like if you have a fracture, things ooze out. It's just gonna be a disaster, right? But turns out, no, so these animals, this is how they roll. So it's like the first example of fracture in a living animal system. So this is a shear force. Uh, later on, we did find that um, a tensile force can also give rise to a rapid tissue fracture. So that's a fracture hole opening up in the animal epithelium. And here is uh, analysis of the area versus time. So you can see in two minutes, the area reaches its maximum size. So this is like now a classic fracture mechanics problem in the living animal. Now here's a slide on fracture mechanics. Um, I usually, uh, go over it a bit in detail, but uh, as you know, 
in fracture mechanics, the whole field is trying to characterize materials uh, by loading them and measuring elongation. So you can have like an elastic response and you can have a plastic response. And uh, at some point, any material breaks um, and the entire field of fracture mechanics is trying to figure out what the details are, how different materials fail, right? So the primary modes of failure are tension shear and out of plane shear. So in our case, we actually don't see out of plane shear because remember it's more like a two dimensional system, uh, but we do see mode one and mode two tension and shear induced tissue fractures in these animals. So fantastic system to study fracture mechanics. So now we saw this large scale phenomena. We wanted to understand what the cell scale details look like. So we zoomed in, uh, we went to confocal microscopy. And now what we're doing is, um, so the animal is uh, moving around, we're imaging from below. So um, we're tagging the ventral epithelium and um, I'm using a membrane stain and the lysotracker. So basically we're covering the entire epithelium. These are snapshots on top and live videos in the bottom panel. So at time zero, you see this small dark regions. In about 13 minutes, they grew in size. So these are actually microfractures that grow in size. And this looks like any materials problem, right? So in 13 minutes, they're growing in size. And uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, they form a stable hole. So that's a stable fracture hole in the ventral epithelium. And even more remarkable thing is in another next, let's say 15 minutes or so, this hole can heal itself. So that fracture hole, which appeared here, now the edges simply come close to each other and they simply zip close. So that's an extremely fast uh, tissue fracture and healing process, very, very, very fascinating. And we have all, many, most of these questions are open now. After this, we are trying to figure out so many details from now on. This is the first time we saw this. So now uh, we were wondering if we can construct a simple model based on these experimental observations. I will go a little bit faster. Uh, so this is a simple heuristic model based on experiments. This effort was led by Matt Bull. Uh, so we were inspired to model the ventral epithelium. And this is like an epithelial alloy. It has bidispersity, two cell types. And we have non-confluence as an important part of all this. Uh, and we have make lots of simplifying assumptions like no cell deformation, a local hexatic order. So this is what we came up with as a sticky ball spring model. And uh, the cells are held uh, by connected to each other by springs. So now we started with the vertex model and we really are interested in fast loading time scales. And we focus mainly on the adhesion term. And uh, we are looking at uh, dynamics of cell-cell junctions. And we looked at two key parameters, force and um, L break is the length at which springs break. So uh, we carried out, looked at things like shear transformations, bond failures, and put them together and uh, came up with the phase diagram and force versus L break, you can see that there are three distinct regions that we identified, elastic, ductile, and brittle. So I'll show you one video, video from each. So this is an elastic simulation. We're pulling an silico tissue, two-dimensional, kind of boring. And once I go to the ductile case, you're actually seeing local cell remodeling. So this is a very particulate kind of a simulation. And the brittle case, you actually see that it captures fractures. Right, so this is steady loading. The real animal has unsteady loading. So we did that and we can show that unsteady pulling actually gave rise to both fractures and healing. And now we wanted to see if uh, we can quantify signatures of fractures in whole entire animals. Um, so we carried out this non-affine motion analysis. So this is popular in soft, in soft matter and uh, like colloidal gel literature. Um, here you can, kind of characterize for a bunch of particles, what happens in the sense, uh, is the motion after a certain time step uniform or disordered? So this works really well. So this measure is the D square minimum measure from uh, Falk and Langer in 1998. Um, so here, every particle that you see with a uh, white or red color has non-affine motion. So it's very good at picking up things like shear bands. So it's a fantastic measure. And we looked at the correlation between this and the internal strain, if you remember the PIV, and it looks like they're really nicely correlated. So we tried to use this to say something about the material properties using this as a shear measure and the strain rate measure. And if we see something like this, we could say that it's like a yield stress material. And that's kind of what we found in experiments and in the model. 
so the answer is yes it looks like it is like a yield stress material and others like uh, in, in the compass lab in UCSB have shown that uh, there's spatially graded yield stress in zebrafish embryo development but just again adding to this so we talked about factors what are the consequences for the animal what is the biological significance so when we watched the culture dishes, we found that these animals have fractures all the time. So this is now longer time scales. We image for 10 hours or something. So this half an hour, a fracture op uh, opens up in the ventral, and then it heals quickly, right? So fractures are physiological in these animals. So we figured out how uh, they're accomplishing this on an everyday basis. So what you saw was this process where a fracture hole opens up in half an hour, then it closes. We see the same animal, after six hours, you don't see any trace of fractures. And uh, so that those were all ventral fractures. There can be fractures in the dorsal top epithelium also. Those look like this. So this is like a donut. It has a through hole in the animal and the hole is like, expanding in size so much that it will become thin, becomes more thin. So this is now five hours. Uh, it'll go on to 10 hours and um, it'll form a small thread and the thread breaks. So now this is where the threaded animals come from. Uh, so these are dorsal, yes. Five minutes. Okay, perfect, thank you. So these are dorsal fractures um, and you can see that the animal is now like a donut and um, after like 10 hours, the, it forms this long threaded animal. So now with, these, with this fracture phenomena, we're able to explain the entire shape space of these animals. Uh, so here is some statistics uh, showing you that, like I imaged like for two months I was sitting on the confocal. Uh, this is the total number of animals I imaged and this is the number of fractures. So fractures are kind of rare. Ventral fractures and dorsal fractures are pretty rare. They have to be these really large animals. Um, and remember this is a lower bound because I used to go home to sleep, but these animals would keep doing this all the time, right? So this is like a lower estimate. So fractures induce permanent shape change on really long time scales. Um, so it turns out fractures are the fastest way to go from this shape to this elongated shapes. And uh, we saw that there are two ways of doing it. Uh, one, would be, one would be the ventral fractures could, which could heal and the dorsal fractures which do not heal and become these long third animals. And in this case, fractures are physiological and they're useful for uh, asexual reproduction in these animals. So that's basically um, in summary. Um, we found for the first time uh, motility induced uh, ductile to brittle uh, tissue deformations. And we found that fractures induce permanent shape change in these animals. And we came up with kind of a new technique to uh, measure quantitatively the properties of tissues in living animals. And remember all of this is without any perturbation. So we are just, watching the animals and we didn't want to do have any perturbation. So this is what the animals are naturally accomplishing. So uh, this work just got published last week, so you can go have a look. Um, I want to highlight that there are several upcoming papers from uh, Prakash Lab on this uh, on, on related topics. Uh, so I covered the tissue mechanics in these animals. Matt, again, is leading an effort on describing the ciliary dynamics, um, how, how, how these animals walk using the cilia, what kind of, all kinds of, um, uh, dynamical models uh, to really explain their behavior. So stay tuned for all these upcoming fantastic stories. So just taking a step back, um, extreme limits of tissue mechanics in living animals. Once again, we're connecting the thin um, structure, the flat architecture of these animals, the form versus how they are, use fracture as a way to change their shape. So form versus function connection. And again, you saw small scale microfractures grow and give rise to these large, uh, micro, large macro fractures. So one slide, uh, so this was the tissue mechanics work. I have one slide to show for my other interest uh, on biological fluid mechanics. So we did this work on starfish larva. So starfish have these really fascinating flow fields. And this work was led by William Gilpin, another fantastic grad student. Uh, he's at Harvard, he's on the faculty job market, fantastic student, fantastic candidate. So we found out that there's a feeding versus swimming trade-off in these uh, type of animals. So uh, this is to acknowledge Manu's lab, what a great lab at Stanford. Um, and I worked with Matt and William mainly. Um, so I want to thank them. And uh, before I finish one minute on, so this was Prakash lab at Stanford. So now I have a new lab, Prakash lab at Miami. Uh, Miami is a great place. It's Miami, right? 
And more, more obvious, more than more importantly, um, so I'm in the Department of Physics and Biology on the main campus. The campus looks like this, um, but we are near the ocean, right? So we have a very strong marine biology school. So plenty of opportunities to collaborate uh, on all types of fantastic marine animals like corals, stenophores. Uh, so plenty of stuff coming up, stay tuned. If you're a student, if you're interested in the PhD or postdoc, spending a few years here in this fantastic place, please let me know. Um, and again, my interest is in tissue mechanics and biological fluid mechanics. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll take questions. Thank you, Vivek, for this nice presentation. We have a few questions. Um, so the first one is from Wiley. He yes. says that it's difficult to ensure that the particles are true markers of the of the cells. Are they done, they're not moving in on the organisms? Yes. Um, so you're if you're referring to the beads data set, uh, really. Um, so we are doing like a coarse graining, coarse grain mapping. So it's one bead for every ten cells. So um, so it's more like trying to obtain at this many millimeter scale uh, coarse grain description of the flow field. Uh, but actually one thing we know from controls is the beads do stick permanently. So once they stick, uh, there's 95% plus retention. Um, but you're right, um, in terms of zooming in, um, it's kind of one bead per 10 cells. But this technique can be improved and that's, trying to, that's what I'm trying to work on. Good question, thank you. Yeah. So another question from Sharon Lubke. Uh, does the placosome maintain a thickness or yes. it changes? Yeah, no, great question. So it turns out that body plan is actually conserved. Uh, it always maintains its, thick, its thickness, uh, but the 24 micron thickness is conserved, but uh, it can vary in size. And that gives rise to a lot of beautiful properties. And uh, Matt and I and several others, we're looking at this. Now. So there's a size dependent uh, scaling with behavior. Okay. Thank you. Good question. So, and this was a question of more than one person. So, Ricard and, and Wiley, do you think of the tissue as a solid because of the fast time scales of the deformations? Yeah, I mean, fantastic question, right? So, it's kind of a solid, um, which has this nice uh, ductile transition. So, there's a competition between flow and fracture, uh, and this really depends on uh, the loading. And um, so it's kind of a fascinating yield stress solid, which can have uh, liquid like, you know, flow when um, due to cell rearrangements. Um, but with the, that's a ductile response I was talking about, but it could also have a fracture response. So yeah, so it's it's a fascinating system in that sense. It's hard to pin one, one word on it and say it. So do any cell, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Do any cells rupture? during the crack formation or only the junctions come apart? Again, very good question. Uh, what we've seen is uh, plenty of cells rupture. So there is quite some loss there. There is quite some disruption at the, ed at the edges. Um, having said that, it's not, uh, we haven't quantified that uh, in one sense, but um, there is plenty of material that is shed because of uh, dead cells and dead fragments in the tissue, yeah. And that's something we will quantify and learn more about. So there is a question from Robin. Can you measure the complex modulus of the tissue using rheology? We can. Uh, so we've tried to do something like uh, traction force or microscopy, but it's tricky because the traction is with the cilia, which have very uh, finite uh, contact times. So that doesn't directly work for us, but um, we are and Manus lab people are, we are trying to have a kind of a controlled rheological uh, response to this. So these are all techniques that we're developing right now. So we would, that's one of our next steps, how to rheologically like really characterize this with controlled perturbations. But whatever I talked about today was all uh, just watching uh, all in native conditions. So we're not doing anything. Okay. Uh, so could, this is from David Lubensky. Could you explain more what you mean when you say that the shoe is non-confluent? Right. Not so, 
barrier function? Uh, can small molecules cross it? What does the spatial distribution of adherence junction versus region without adherence junction look like? Yeah, great question. Uh, again, we, we are looking into those details uh, systematically, but uh, what I mean by non-confluence is that there are these regions of microfractures that we see exist in many animals, uh, which are proper like holes in the tissue. Um, so whenever we, in our model, what we tried was to uh, really account for this non-confluence. So uh, in that sense, um, what I can say is we know uh, from the biology literature is that uh, that there are only these other junctions holding cells together. But uh, what we mean when we say non-confluence is we want to allow for uh, these microfactors to be existent and we want to model, mainly we wanted to capture the fracture phenomena in this, in this study. But plenty of questions there on exactly uh, what the molecular details are. Yeah, we don't really understand it completely yet. <laughs> 